स्कूल अब बायोसाइंसेस शाहकारी युद्धा पाप प्रोफेसर ओबीजी दास ओबीजी दास तार बोक्तो बे बिषय हलो स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ न्यूरॉन रेस्टिंग मेम्ब्रेन पोटेंशियल ओरिजिन ऑफ एक्शन पोटेंशियल एंड इट्स प्रोपागेशन एक्टर्स द माइलिनेटेड नर्व फाइबर्स ये बिषय टी पाठोक्रमेर सेम थ्री एर शोष्टो पत्रेर अंतर्फुक्तो अमी बर्धमान राज कॉलेजेर प्राणी विद्या विभागेर मानुनियों शहजिगे उद्धापक डॉक्टर शैमदास बंदोपाध्याय महोत्सव के आज केर बौक्ता की उपस्थापितो कॉलर चुने उन्नरोध कोर्ची थैंक यू वेरी मच गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरीवन इट्स अगेन अ प्लेजर टू हैव यू ऑल अराउंड फॉर दिस इंटरैक्टिव सेशन एस यू ऑल नो बीइंग ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय द जूलॉजिकल एसोसिएशन ऑफ बाडवन टुडे वी हैव डॉक्टर अभिजीत दास एन एक्सपर्ट इन क्रोमैटिन बायोलॉजी एंड एपिजेनेटिक्स करेंटली एसोसिएटेड एज एन असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर इन द स्कूल ऑफ बायोसाइंस इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी खरगपुर आल्सो हैपेंस टू बी अ फॉर्मर मेंबर ऑफ दिस एस्टीम्ड एसोसिएशन डॉक्टर दास वाज बोर्न एंड ब्रेड इन दिस टाउन who pursued his bachelor degree in zoology from Vivekananda Mohavidyalaya Badwan follow on masters in zoology from Banaras Hindu University and then he completed his doctoral degree from the National Center for Biological Sciences popularly known as NCBS TIFR Bangalore one of the premier institute in India he is an alumni of Garden Institute University of Cambridge United Kingdom he was the recipient of several prestigious awards including Ramalinga Sami Re-Entry Fellowship from the Department of Biotechnology Government of India and Fellowship of Indo-Swiss Bilateral Research Initiative, Ecole Polytechnic Federal de Lausanne, Switzerland. Dr. Das has authored and co-authored numerous publications in peer-reviewed journals, which are of international repute. Let's give him a big hand and begin with the session. Please, Dr. Das. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Sam, for introducing me in such a nice way. And uh, and thanks to uh, a big thanks to the Logical Association of Bortman for inviting me to give this lecture. So with that, I will uh, start off immediately because we have very small time and we have to cover a lot of things. So uh, yes, I, I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Every uh, student, whoever is uh, present, can hear me. Sam, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. And my screen is visible, I hope. Yes, it is. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. So, uh, to everyone, so this is the uh, so the topic has been introduced already what i'm going to cover today so this is solely targeted towards you the students the uh, undergrad students whoever is studying in uh, semester three or whatever semester you are in so i'm sure you can gain something from this lecture i'll be more than happy to to take you through this topic and uh, maybe some of you already know the topic some of you are slightly familiar some of you are totally familiar but you are very much uh, welcome to ask me questions interrupt me in the middle uh, of course, keeping in view the total time we have. Okay, so we are, uh, so let's start with the lecture. So I have uh, titled my total lecture in this uh, this different title that is fundamentals of brain function. So what we are going to learn today is the enigma of the brain. But of course, we cannot uh, cover the whole topic. That is probably a very thick book that it will be. So instead of that, we learn the very very basic of the brain function so this is our brain of course it's a simulated version and what we do today or every day is totally dictated or guided by our brain as you are listening to the lecture watch a movie or listen to a song memorize something remember your old past memories and analyze everyday events to take necessary actions every action of your day-to-day -day activity is guided by the brain all your physiological metabolic activities are there that your body is performing anyway but your brain is dictating almost everything so that is uh, one of the most complicated science to understand the brain uh, it's all uh, it's uh, said these days that if you uh, if there is one science that is most complex that is equivalent or more complex than the rocket science that is neuroscience so how we uh, sense our environment and how we take necessary actions 
those are included under this topic called cognitive science or neuroscience. So of course, we'll study the very basic of it and the fundamental of brain function, of course, is dictated by, again, neurons, a very tiny uh, cells, just like any other cell of our body. And these are the structural and functional unit of our brain. And these uh, cells, to study them, uh, your syllabus has these given topics that is structured to understand the structure of neuron, to understand how they function. And that is divided into these subtopics called resting membrane potential, origin of action potential, and how this action potential propagates across different types of nerve, fiber, nerve fibers. So in order to start that, I will take you through very, very basic of uh, life science. So what is the characteristic of a living system? Let's understand that first, and that will make our uh, job easy. So I'm sure you appreciate that we all are very highly complex structures in the universe and that are uh, evolved over the course of evolution. And we have organized a system for extracting, transforming, and using energy from the environment. We are we can adapt, we can evolve. One of the very basic tenets of life is ability to develop and grow. And of course, the capacity to recapitulate ourselves so that we keep a copy of ourselves in the form of progeny. And the last, not the least, and I believe one of the very important one is the mechanism of uh, sensing and responding to the to our environment. So here we are talking about how to receive signal from outside and how to send signal outside and in the process modulating the signal. So that's what our brain does. So our brain is just for sensing the environment and responding accordingly and taking action. How do they do so? So uh, they do so by the structural and functional unit of our brain that is called neuron. Of course, a neuron is just one unit. We have billions of neurons in our brain, but a neuron's function, if you understand that, we'll understand a lot of the brain function. So let's see what a neuron looks like. So this is just a typical cell that we have studied that we know that what it is composed of, how it looks like. This is a typical animal cell. Most often we draw it as a sphere, a sphere or a circle. And then inside it, we put a lot of things, a lot of tiny dots, big circles, uh, these uh, subcellular organelles. But unlike a typical cell, a neuron looks quite weird. It's, it's, it has a particular very uh, different shape compared to a typical cell. At a glance, it doesn't ever at all look like a cell. So it has a very uh, quite large, almost like a sphere cell body. So that is, you can compare that with the normal animal cell. Beyond that, there are many branches that the cell forms. So these are nothing but hands and legs of the cell, if you want to call it like that. So these are tiny branches, which are called dendrites. I'm sure these structures you have learned from your childhood, from class seven onwards, I guess. So these are, uh, we are not learning anything new from there. So these are called dendrites, which are the signal receiving units of, of these neurons. Then there is a large or long tail like structure, which is called axon. This axon is sometimes is the part which projects from the cell and then goes and connects to something else. This something could be another neuron or it could be another muscle. So it can say receive signal from dendrite, process it somehow, and then take it and send it to another neuron or to another muscle. By that process, it, so you can already appreciate that this is the function of the, our brain also. Send the signal, sorry, receive the signal from some, somehow and then send it to our muscle so that we can take necessary action. So in this uh, neuron, we have sometimes this neuron's axon part is coated with a special type of sheath or co covering, which is called myelin sheath. They are of huge importance. We'll learn about that later. Okay, so this is just one neuron and that is, you are seeing it, that it is connecting to another neuron. So uh, neurons, as you have seen before, that this is the structure. It has a one signal receiving end, another signal sending end, but that is very typical neuronal cell. There are multiple variations of that neuronal cell, as you can also appreciate that how much variations are there of typical animal cells. Each cell of our body looks different than this one. So neurons are also not exception. They also have variations. So this is the one we have learned so far. That's the unipolar typical neuron. That is unipolar means here based on how many branches are present in which side that dictates what type we call them. So this is unipolar. That is, it has only one pole. The bipolar, it has two poles. The cell body sits in the middle and two long branches start from that cell body. Pseudo unipolar. 
this new cell body sends one branch that then can form multiple branches so it's like one pole but it's not really one pole it has multiple poles then there are multiple real multiple cells where the uh, cell body sends multiple projections which are then right so it has multiple ends endpoints from or poles from which it can receive signals and then there is one another end which sends the signal to another cell so in this way you can divide neurons but of course there are multiple other variations of these subtypes we're not going to that detail instead we'll go to the functional aspects of neuron that is most interesting and that's how we can make a make an attempt to understand brain function so what is so special about neurons that make them neurons that make them most crucial cells of our body that is in one sentence you can you can define that as neurons which are the cells which can receive and transmit information that's what they specialize for and let's see what is that speciality again let's go back to very basic before we go to neuron because this is very important to understand so this is a cell's membrane i'm sure you have studied cell membrane structure if you not i'm sure you will in few uh, months you will be learning about that so this is a cell's uh, em structure you can see very well that there, there is a covering outside the cell that covering is called cell membrane which is composed of nothing but lipids and proteins these red uh, human like structures are the lipids these are kind of uh, making a coating on the cell and making it semi permeable so that not everyone can enter the cell not every molecule can exit the cell so this form a barrier in the barrier there are some other structures studded within that bilayer so this is kind of a 3d structure of the of a piece of the membrane in which you can see that membrane proteins are located so this moment proteins have huge uh, significance in our context they have a very specific function in neuronal uh, neuronal function so let's see what those are so this before we go there they are go to understand they are the these proteins function so let's talk about differential permeability of the membrane so as i said the membrane is not permeable to everything and anything instead it can block entry or exit of certain molecules and allow certain other molecules so this uh, arrows are telling you how easily these hydrophobic molecules can pass but these ions on the other hand because they are charged particles or the large particles like glucose or sucrose they cannot pass so easily through the membrane so these are called these these are effectively blocked by the membrane but our cell has to take up ions has to give i send ions outside so how do they do that they do that by means of special type of proteins that are present in the membrane so these proteins are called channels so these channels kind of form a pore across the membrane through which these charged molecule can pass which are otherwise blocked by the hydrophobic membrane right so these channels can be of various types and of course one major property of these channels the channels that we are talking about in the membrane are very selective and they can connect the cytosol to the cell exterior that is they are allowing things to pass which are otherwise non permeable many channels are there in the membranes which are ion channels remember we said that ions are not they find it very difficult to pass through the membrane so there are many ion channels which allow channel ions to pass a very uh, beautiful property of these channels are they are gated they can be opened or closed just like your uh, house gates right so and this channel activity can be very easily regulated by the modification of the channel proteins these are proteins nothing but amino acid sequences so you can imagine that they can be modi modified or modulated and advantage of these channels are that they are very fast disadvantage is that they cannot be coupled to energy source that is uh, they are uh, only allowing ions when there is a gradient so what is gradient we will come there but let's talk a little bit about the ion channels so there are there are different types of ion channels one is leakage channel so whenever there is a uh, ion concentration gradient that is that is if there is more ion inside compared to outside these channels will just leak the ion that is this is allowing the ions to pass so that there is a balance of ion numbers across the cell across the cell membrane then there are gated channels i was talking about gates so here there are gates channels are not always open always closed they can be according to need opened or closed so now this gating can be of various types some are gated by voltage depending on what is the voltage difference between inside and outside and what i mean by voltage difference i'll come to that 
So there are other types like ligand gated ion channels. For example, a protein can bind to the channel and effectively open or close the channel. By doing so, it uh, allows our ions to pass or blocks the ions to pass. So there are different types. I'm not discussing too much about them. Let's go to other channels like mechanically gated ion channels, which can open or close depending on uh, the uh, different mechanical stimulus. So for today's topic, we will be mostly considered on concentrated on these two types of channels, which one is called leakage channel, and there is voltage. So this is the this is showing you the gray bar is showing you the uh, kind of the membrane, and across the membrane there is a concentration gradient of ions. So this and in the middle this uh, this uh, channel is sitting, which will which would allow the ions to pass, but only when this channel is open. So this is voltage gated channel. Once a certain voltage difference exists between inside and outside, then it opens, and then the ions are uh, allowed to pass. Second is the ligand gated ion channel. This is the, the blue thing is the channel, which when binds to a particular ligand, it could be a protein, it could be a small molecule, but on binding to that, a specific ligand, it opens up so that it allows ions to pass. Similarly, there are other channels. I'm not going to discuss about them. You can read up with the reference I'll be giving at the end. So this is one very important part before we understand neurons. So this is uh, telling you what is a gradient. So by gradient, we have uh, observed what gradient means. If there is a uh, difference in concentration in inside versus outside of a cell. So this is again, the gray bar is a membrane. In between, in the membrane, there are multiple proteins sitting there. So this is, uh, and these arrows are showing whether the ions are, uh, the ions are passing or not. Okay, so these are, uh, and in between, these uh, ion channels are sitting. So this is showing you multiple molecules as a cartoon. So these round uh, or square dots that you are seeing in different colors are signifying that there are more ions on this side of the membrane compared to this other side of the membrane. So there is a steep concentration gradient of these boxes or, or the round, round structures. So there'll be always a gradient which is, which is asking these molecules to pass through the membrane. That is the basic or fundamental way a diffusion happens, right? But through the membrane, diffusion always cannot happen because these are, these are ions, if they are charged particles, they cannot move across. So there is a concentration gradient, so what? They cannot pass. But if there is a channel which is allowing them to, them to pass, then they will go. But go in what direction? That is dictated by this concentration gradient, right? So if so, these yellow molecules, which are there are three outside and one inside, then if this channel is allowing them to pass, the yellow is always always going to pass from outside to inside. Till when? Till the concentration gradient is dissipated. If there is no more gradient, this, this will stop. This passage will stop. So uh, now that is concentration gradient. But what if we can? Uh, we have to also consider the electrical gradient. When they are passing, they are not only passing molecules, they are also carrying charge. So that is also uh, causing the charge distribution difference between inside and outside of the membrane, right? So we have different types of ions inside our cell as well as in the extracellular fluid. So for example, sodium, potassium, or chloride ions, and their asymmetric distribution around, around the membrane causes a con ionic difference, sorry, the charge difference between them. And the charge dif difference, if you consider in isolated manner, that also forms a gradient. And that gradient is not concentration gradient only, that's an electrical gradient. That is, there might be an effective net positive charge outside compared to inside. So it will be outside will be more positive than inside. So that's what is being shown by shown here. Outside, if there are more positively charged ion, the, the, uh, across two sides of the membrane, there will be a charge distribution difference. And that will cause an electrical gradient to exist. Now, on top of that, you can also consider chemical or concentration gradient. Together, they are called electrochemical gradient, electrochemical charge distribution and chemical distribution difference. Together, they are called electrochemical gradient. So um, you have to keep that in mind when we are considering membrane function in, uh, in terms of neurons potential difference. 
So what is a membrane potential? So this is this potential is arising when there is a difference in the electrical charge on the two sides of a membrane. Remember that is just generated by ionic concentration difference between two sides. And because they are carrying electrical charge, there is electrical charge difference between inside and outside of a membrane. They can result from multiple things. So here we have to consider multiple things when we are con considering how this membrane potential is different. Uh, membrane potential is generated. So they are resulting from passive diffusion of the ions by the channels that we have discussed, as well as there are multiple types of pumps. When you uh, study about membrane, you will learn that there are multiple types of uh, pumps which are pumping ions from inside to outside or outside to inside. So they are, these are ATP utilizing pumps which uh, can pump different types of charged particle from inside to outside. So that is leading to generation of this charge difference. So initially, suppose there is no charge difference. This, so here we are, we are now discussing how this ionic uh, imbalance happens. So suppose there is a, this uh, no charge distribution difference between two sides of the membrane. So suddenly, uh, suppose there is a small flow of the ions from one side of the membrane to outside. Why would it happen? Because inside our cell, there are many organic uh, molecules, for example, proteins, amino acids, and others, which are negatively charged. They effectively drag the positively charged ions from outside to inside. So what happens is there is a net flow of positive charge, positively charged potassium ions mainly from outside to inside of the membrane. That leads to, so, so this is causing the potassium ions to move this side. And when they're there, they are, form, they are also willing to at, uh, attract the negatively charged ion from other side. So in this way, positively charged ions will be lined on one side of the membrane, on one side of the membrane, and they will form an electrostatic attraction for the oppositely charged ions on the other side of the membrane. In this way, there can be an imbalance between charged particles. For a normal typical cell, this this are the, these are the different types of ions which are distributed asymmetrically across the membrane. So you'll find sodium is present more on the outside. Uh, so you will see that cytoplasmic concentration is much lower compared to the extracellular. extracellular. So there is more sodium ions out, outside compared to inside. So what will happen? There is always a steep concentration gradient between its outside and inside. Lots of sodium is waiting outside to enter the cell, but they cannot enter the cell. Why? Because they are impermeable and not there are not ma many free sodium ion allowing uh, channels which will allow sodium to pass in. So sodium is always kept more outside, less inside. On the other hand, so potassium is just, just the opposite. Inside our cell, there is more potassium compared to outside. And sodium, that potassium always forms a gradient from inside to outside. So sodium and potassium always forms an opposite gradient, potassium more inside, sodium more outside. We have to remember this for understanding ourselves. And they, these are other different types of ions whose distribution is also forming gradients. So we can understand that there is a difference in potential or difference in charge distribution between inside and outside of a cell. And here we have to consider how that can change. And fundamental of neuronal function is nothing but dependent on this membrane potential. That's how it works. Let's uh, see what are happening here. So, so this is just what we have already discussed. Like cells have negatively charged organic molecules, which are uh, allow, which are asking potassium to come in. So there are lots of potassium coming in. And how they are coming in? We have discussed that there are leak channels in the membrane, and only type of leak channel that is present in plenty are the potassium leak channels. That's why when the inorganic molecules are attracting potassium, potassium can freely move in. And when they have moved in, they stay inside after reaching a particular concentration. And that concentration is called potassium ion equilibrium, potassium equilibrium concentration. So we could go and discuss a little more, but at this point, I think that will be uh, time consuming. So if you are interested, in read a little bit about potassium equilibrium concentration and how they are generated. Okay, so that is your one of the homeworks that you can do. Then, then at this equilibrium condition of potassium ion, there is no net flow of ions happening in the across the plasma membrane. So some potassium ion has gone inside, it has reached an equilibrium 
and then no net flow of ions is happening. Of course, some ions are going in, going out, but net flow is important. That is no net extra charge distribution, charge distribution change is happening at this point. And that point, when it is reached, it's called resting membrane potential. So in, at resting membrane potential, a particular concentration difference between different ions have reached, and that is this, that has exist that is existing all the time, unless changed. And that situation is called resting membrane potential. When there is a particular concentration of potassium present inside the cell, and that is causing a particular membrane potential to exist. And that membrane potential is called resting membrane potential. Usually all our cells have a particular resting membrane potential because all our cells have this plasma membrane across which ions can flow. But neurons are slightly more special because they have a particular uh, ionic gradient, a particular resting membrane potential, which allows them to make a change in that and that excites the cell. Okay, so before we go there, so this is the resting membrane potential of normal animal cell, which is variable between minus 20 millivolt to minus 120 millivolt, depending on which organism and which cell type. But in, in our neurons, specifically, the, action, uh, the resting membrane potential is around minus 70 millivolt. But when we say minus and a particular number of millivolt, that means inside of our cell is always more negative compared to the outside. That's why it is denoted as minus 70 millivolt. How much difference? Minus 70 is the 70 millivolt difference between inside and outside, inside being more negative. Right, so now we'll uh, go a little further from resting membrane potential and try to understand what is action potential. So uh, I hope you have understood what resting membrane potential means. If it is, if I'm going too fast uh, for the sake of time, please stop me now and ask me a question. So uh, let me know what is your question about resting membrane potential first. Okay, your silence will be taken as you have understood everything, right? So uh, your main, uh, you may wait until the end and ask me questions at the end, but I'll be happy to answer. But if this is the time when you can ask. Okay, so the resting membrane potential, let me remind you again, is just the state of the cell where there is net, no net ion flow is happening from inside or outside to the other side and we have reached a particular concentration electrochemical gradient where the inside has more negative charge compared to the outside and we have reached at around minus 70 millivolt across membranes. So now, so how do we measure that? We can measure that by just poking an electrode through the, through the cell. Keep one electrode outside, keep one electrode inside of a cell and by that process you can measure what is the potential difference between them. Right, so this is nothing different than the type of experiments you do to measure potential difference. So here, let's go to the next step, that is generation of action potential. So this is a membrane. So this same cartoon will be repeated multiple times. So this is showing you a membrane. Inside the yellow part is the cytoplasm. Outside the green, uh, sky, blue, sky blue is the exterior. In the membrane, you can see multiple types of channels sitting there. And these channels, one is showing as potassium channel, another is written as sodium channel. So this potassium channel is uh, closed. And the sodium channel is also closed. Right. So this is the resting stage. Here we are not seeing any leak channel. So these are another type of channel that we discussed are these are called voltage gated channels. Right. So these are voltage gated channels and they will be effectively opened or closed depending on what, depending on voltage, because these are voltage gated channels. Unless a certain amount of voltage is, certain level of voltage is reached, they will not, not be opened. They are mostly closed unless a particular voltage is reached. Right, and this sodium channel has a very peculiarity that this has two gates. One is activation gate, another is inactivation gate. So we'll discuss about that as the time comes. Okay, so at this point, this is resting state. And what is the potential difference between them? Inside is more negative, and that is 70 millivolt more negative than outside. Right, so that's the state we are in. We are in resting state. So when we receive a stimulus from outside, 
this neuron gets activated or excited. How does it get excited? Just like you get excited upon looking at something great or something beautiful. Similarly, a neuron can also get excited. And when it gets excited, it changes the ionic balance. That is from minus 70 millivolt potential difference suddenly changes to something else. So that, let's see what happens. So this is when that happens, it is called depolarization of the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is having a polarity, right? Inside is negative, outside is positive, and there is a value, minus 70 millivolt. And that is called polarization of the membrane, polarized membrane. So now, if that changes to a positive value inside or less negative value inside, that is depolarization of the plasma membrane. So that is, that is the shift in the membrane potential to a less negative value inside. We had minus 70 millivolt inside. So let's plot that. In a resting phase, the resting state, we can just denote minus 70 as the RMP, that is resting membrane potential. So this has been denoted here as minus 70 millivolt. This is a plot of millivolt, that is potential difference, changing over time. This will change when the neuron gets excited, when the neuron is stimulated. How does it get stimulated? We'll talk about that. But before that, let's see how it, what happens when a neuron gets stimulated. So at time zero, it is minus 70 millivolt. Unless you give a particular stimulus to the neuron, it will keep maintaining minus 70 millivolt forever. But if you stimulate the neuron, things change. What will be the change? The change is called either depolarization or the whole event that will be followed here are called action potential. So we'll talk about that later. Let's see what is happening. First, you stimulate the neuron and that stimulation immediately changes the balance of it. What changes the balance of it? It goes up. It in, in the in the y axis, you have minus 70 kept here. Zero would be somewhere here. So if it goes down, you will reach zero. There is, uh, sorry, you will you'll go minus words. Zero would be somewhere here. So if it goes up, we can reach zero. And then we can go plus, plus 30. So what would happen? What would need to happen when we need to go up? That is when we have to increase the membrane potential from minus 70 towards zero. That is membrane potential has to go up. What do we have to do? Can anyone answer me in a very short duration of time? What kind of change has to happen here? So can you repeat the question, please? So the question is, suppose I'm telling that here we have to uh, change the membrane potential. The membrane potential is based on ionic concentration difference. Right. So the ionic concentration difference exists between inside and outside, and that is dictating mem resting membrane potential. And here, let me draw it in a bigger way, but it's a terra way. So let's do let's stick to that. This is minus 70 millivolt. But I'm saying resting membrane potential is keeping it like that. And I'm asking you how the membrane potential can, can go up. What has to change so that this membrane potential would go up, would change to a more positive value. So, so many graded potential has to be uh, occurred to uh, uh, uplift the voltage. Yes, potential has to change, but uh, what has to enter or exit the cell? I'm asking, that, so there is ionic disbalance, ionic gradient. So ions can pass through. Okay, do it through the channels. So these channels can open or close, but wh what type of thing can change? What type of ion can move in or out so that this minus can become plus? This inside cell we had minus, it has to become plus. So what type of ion has to move in? Sodium. Plus of sodium ion. Yes. So K plus has to move in and uh, K plus has to move yes. out and sodium has to move in. Yes, some of you have given right answers and some of you have given wrong, slightly wrong answer, but your idea is right. So the thing is, only one type of ion will move in. One type of ion can move in, and in this case it is sodium ion. Because there is more sodium out outside. Remember we said there is a more sodium ions, there are more sodium ions waiting outside just to be taken in. They are not taken in because this activation gate of this, uh, of this membrane of the sodium channel is closed, right? So this activation gate is closed, so sodium cannot pass in. So now, 
when this action or the depolarization happens, it happens due to sodium channel opening and sodium moving in. If sodium moves in, our problem solved that we are depolarizing the membrane. That is from minus 70, it is going upwards. Right. So uh, action potential, the, the generation, the first step of action, generation of action potential is nothing but changing the gradient towards more positive value by allowing sodium to move in. Right. So that's what happens here. Ah, just give me a second. Yes. So when a neuron gets excited, it opens sodium channel. And let me tell you, these are voltage gated sodium channels. So you can immediately ask if they are voltage gated sodium channels, they will be their opening or closing will be dictated by a particular voltage. If they are at minus 70 already, at minus 70, they are closed. If they are at minus 70, if a voltage change has not happened, then how will they open it? So, so that is solved by how the neuron is first stimulated. So there are many ways to stimulate a neuron. So I'm sure uh, at your kindergarten, you have learned about five senses. We have five senses and five types of receptor neurons, sensory neurons are present in our nose, tongue, skin, ear, and eyes. They are stimulated by what type of stimulants? Our eye has photoreceptor. They get stimulated by light. Our nose has olfactory receptors. They get stimulated by some olfactory chemicals, some good cooking is happening in your kitchen that is coming in your nose and those neurons, you can feel that there is a good cooking is happening because your nose neurons are getting stimulated by that chemical sitting on your ne neuron. So that chemical slightly opens a special type of channel, which are again sodium channels. So these sodium channels immediately open to take it slightly higher. And at this slightly higher, it is, it is about minus 55 millivolt. So when this minus 55 millivolt is reached by this, this chemical or light, whatever sitting is sitting on your uh, receptor neurons, they are slightly stimulated from minus 70 to minus 55. Some sodium ion has come in. When this goes to minus 55 and this minus 55 is the voltage, minus 55 millivolt is the voltage to remove this activation gate. This activation gate that I was showing here that opens up at minus 55. So to activate this channel, you need to reach that voltage and that is called threshold potential. So minus 55 is a threshold for opening the sodium channels, the voltage gated sodium channel. These are voltage gated. So when they see, they see minus 55 has been raised, they open and there are hundreds or thousands of these sodium channels all open and all allow huge amount of sodium ions to pass in. As they are passing in, this immediately goes up because more and more sodium ions are going in. This more and more plus ions are moving in, so the action potential goes up. And then, of course, sodium channel has another property this, that is called inactivation gate. So it gets inactivated at plus 30. So plus 30 is the voltage when that is reached by movement of huge amount of sodium ions. Okay, so that is what is shown here in the depolarization state. In the depolarization state, sodium, this gate has been opened, sodium is moving in, and there is more sodium going inside. And the ions are showing to be, the charge distribution is showing to be inside more positive than outside. That is around plus 30 has been reached. When plus 30 or plus 50 in some cases, uh, between plus 30 and plus 50, when it is reached, the sodium channels that had been opened before, now they are getting closed. So that is called the peak of the action potential. So this whole thing that we are studying now, before this was resting neuron potential. Now we are studying what is happening to the neuron after it gets simulated is called action potential. And this first part of the action potential is called depolarization. Okay, so this depolarization has happened because the polarity has changed inside the uh, from inside to outside of the cell. So due to the polarity change, we have now reached plus side. So this action potential has peaked. After reaching the peak, sodium channel is closed. Uh, but that is not the only event that is happening at the peak of the action potential. Another thing is happening. That is called another ion, uh, another ion channel is sitting here. That is called potassium channel. So immediately at potassium at plus 30 is the activation for signal for the potassium ion channel. 
voltage gated potassium ion channels so these voltage gated potassium ion channels will open at plus 30 not just closure of sodium channels so potassium channels are now opening so what is the direction of potassium ion movement there is more potassium waiting inside compared to outside remember i said there are more potassium normally present inside the cell compared to outside so lots of potassium will move out as they are moving out they are carrying positive charge so inside will start becoming negative so action potential is going downwards right so it is going downwards so it's going down 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 and it has come back to normalcy to some extent normalcy because this this reaches uh, beyond minus 70 so that is happening because lots of potassium ions are moving out right so here what sodium has come in potassium has gone out and when it stops this and that stops because this voltage gated potassium channel can stop at minus 80 millivolt okay so at minus 80 millivolt this potassium channel will close and no more distribution of sodium no more rearrangement of potassium channel sodium channel so the ions will happen so that's called the end of the action potential but that is not really the end that has taken the action potential to minus 80 millivolt instead of minus 70. so that minus 80 millivolt because it has gone even beyond the resting membrane potential that is called hyperpolarization state and that is around whose voltage is around minus 80 millivolt okay so now two things happen sodium channels at the peak closed but or inactivated because this is the inactivation channel so sodium channel, sodium ions are not moving out potassium channels which opened at minus plus 30 are now closed at minus 80. so have we really reached the resting membrane potential there are two things went wrong one is you can already imagine minus 80 millivolt is not exactly same as minus 70 and another thing is different compared to the rmp resting membrane potential what is that Here, we started with resting membrane potential where inside has more, inside had more potassium ions, outside had more sodium ions. But during this action potential that reversed, inside now has more sodium ions, outside has more potassium ions because of this whole scenario, whole action potential. Though we have reached our uh, uh, resting membrane, nearly resting membrane potential, but the ionic disbalance, how will you dissipate that? That is a bit difficult, right? Now, these channels will not be able to dissipate that because they are voltage gated before they reach a different action potential, different level, they are not getting, not allowing sodium or potassium to pass through them. So, something has to change. Who will do that? So, now there is a different type of uh, machinery present here in the membrane, which we are not showing. Those are called sodium potassium pump. So, those sodium potassium pumps are going to make the change so these are the sodium potassium pumps here which pumps sodium out sodium ions will be moved out and the same pump moves potassium in so that pump makes everything all right sodium moves out potassium moves in and in the process it actually pumps three sodium in one round it moves three sodium outside and two potassium inside so anyway but by doing so it also changes the resting membrane point the ionic disbalance sodium moves you out potassium moves in the potential comes back to minus 70 okay so it remains at minus 70 millivolt so that's how the ionic disbalance is dissipated as well as resting membrane potential is reached so that's how the neuron can get stimulated and then comes back to normal ground state. So several terminologies we have learned here, resting membrane potential, and then there are, so that is minus 70 millivolt. Slight change in membrane potential by some stimulants, take it to minus 55, that is the threshold potential, that is number two here. From threshold potential, one type of voltage gated channel opens, that is voltage gated sodium channel. That shoot, that makes the shooting of the uh, action potential or depolarization to happen. Next, the peak of the action potential at three, where two things happen. Voltage gated sodium channels close, voltage gated potassium channels open. That leads to potassium to, that allows potassium to move in, sorry, move out so that membrane goes through repolarization. That is polarity is reverting back to normalcy, but it does not stop till minus 80 millivolt, which is called hyperpolarization. At hyperpolarized state, the neuron cannot fire again. 
and this moves back to normal ground state minus 70 millivolt by the action of voltage uh, uh, sodium potassium pump this sodium potassium pump uh, allows potassium to move in and sodium to move out so that's how from hyperpolarization you reach a resting membrane potential so here many things have to be considered uh, i'm sure it will take time for you to settle this uh, understanding in your brain but before that i have a uh, couple of other things to discuss one is uh, you are not asking one thing that is when this potential is coming back to normal c minus 55 is being crossed but voltage gated sodium channels which opened at minus 55 they should have opened here right so there would have been another action potential happening here but that is not happening because voltage gated sodium channels have a special mechanism of, of inactivating uh, for some time and that is shown here. So here we are seeing that this is the voltage gated sodium channel and this channel can sense the voltage when it, uh, it is. See, this is the uh, normal closing mechanism. It is closed at resting membrane potential. It opens when that goes to minus 55 so that this is open. But it when it reaches plus 30, this is not closing. The closing mechanism is not starting here. Instead, there is an inactivation mechanism started here at plus 30. That is at the peak of the action potential. This inactivation effectively closes the, action, the, member, closes the channel as well as it keeps it inactivated for a long duration of time so that it does not open immediately. And it is not opening immediately. That property is helping it to remain closed for a long, long time before it goes to a normal closed scenario. And that's how a one action potential can complete normally so that it does not produce another action potential here. That would have made a huge problem. Once you stimulate a neuron, it gets remains in hyper stimulated manner, state all the time so that it does not happen. This voltage gated sodium channel has been evolved and we are saved from continuously giving stimulation to all neurons once that is activated. Right. So that's how voltage gated sodium channels uh, prevent a neuron from firing continuously once it is uh, it has started firing. Another thing, another, another thing that it does is what, uh, what we are studying here is just one neuron's uh, action potential in one particular space. Right. So suppose we are drawing a neuron here. Suppose this is our neuron. We are not drawing too many dendrites or axons here. So suppose this is the cell body. So suppose this is just one dendrite whose this part is being stimulated. So this is the neuron which is getting stimulated. This is the part of the neuron which is getting stimulated. And when we zoom that part in, that is nothing but a membrane. And on, a, on the membrane, these all these channels are there. So all this thing is happening inside and outside ions movement is happening on this tiny bit of the membrane. So what? That's the, that this tiny bit got depolarized and repolarized. The essence of the whole thing of a neuron is that it can spread. It can send the action potential throughout its membrane in this direction as well as in this direction in throughout the membrane. Once it got stimulated at a particular point upon receiving a particular signal that signal is nothing but generating an action potential in that part of the membrane okay so this part of the membrane has generated action potential if we draw like this this is suppose this is the cell membrane which is a barrier between inside and outside and action potential has been generated in this part of the membrane now it now it has to propagate now it has to transmit to other part of this membrane how does that happen so once there is a depolarization in this part, that depolarization can be sensed by the neighboring part. And the neighboring part means in the neighboring region, there are more sodium, voltage gated sodium channels sitting there. So these voltage gated sodium channels will sense that the nearby there is a change in the voltage. So once this has started operating, the neighboring voltage gated sodium channels also are facing voltage change. And that's why they will also open. So it will start propagating. Right. So once action potential has been here, depolarization has happened here, it's neighboring sodium channels, these are also missing that engine action. Then they will see the polarization. They will also open. So it's just because of the neighboring, just because of the input, they will open and they will generate action potential as well. Right. So that's how action potential happens from one part of the to the neighboring part. Now then there are uh, 
other things that to discuss. So we have so far discussed that membrane as if the membranes are bare, naked. They have nothing to wear. But instead, our axons are coated with this myelin C. They work like just an insulator through which ions cannot pass. So this part of the membranes are just like nodes. So they have these coats, and in between coats there are some nodes. So when an axon potential passes through these types of special type of fibers, which are present mostly in the mammalian uh, systems, so uh, once the axon potential is coming is generated, suppose in this part of the membrane, so that transmits. These are not myelinated. These are just normal membrane. Axon potential is transmitting like that. But here there is suddenly a roadblock. Axon potential generated here will not be able to generate an axon potential in this node, in this, uh, sorry, the myelinated part of the membrane because these are insulated. Ions will not pass through the membranes. So what will happen is once it has generated axon potential here, it will immediately generate an axon potential here. And that whose neighboring area where action potential can be generated is here. There an action potential will be generated. So from here onwards, action potential will be hopping from here to here. And that makes it much easier for action potential to pass. This is much faster conduction compared to the other parts of the membrane, where each part of the membrane has to generate action potential. Okay, so this type of conduction of the action potential is called saltatory conduction or kind of a jumping action this is a much faster way to transmit the signal through the neuron okay so then again it has reached the end of the action now it will transmit the signal to the next cell and how that happens is a different story and that so far we have discussed about the chemical way of generating action potential uh, sorry in the ionic way of generating action potential just the ionic balance changes and the channels involved where voltage gated next what happens is it has to pass from one neuron to another neuron, but they are not connected. These membranes are not connected. So if there is an action potential generated here, 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 it cannot generate an action potential to the next next cell in the same way. So, but it has a different mechanism and that mechanism involves some chemicals to be released from the first cell to the next cell. So these both can be neurons. The first one can be definitely a neuron. Second one can be a neuron or a muscle. And to transmit the signal from the first cell to the next cell, this mechanism is involved. Here, in this, uh, at the end of the neuron, which is called a, and, uh, in, and the nearby vicinity, there is a second neuron or a muscle. So this type of structure is called synapse. I'm sure you are familiar with the name, and this gap between them is called a synaptic cleft. So in the synaptic cleft, there is no direct contact between them. So ions cannot ionic disbalance or the action potential cannot be directly transferred. Instead, what happens is this action potential coming at the end of the axon induces these vesicles to open up to the exterior. So these are special type of vesicles of the cell. These vesicles carry a special type of chemical called neurotransmitter. So these neurotransmitters, once the vesicles are released, these vesicles, once they fuse with the cell membrane, they release these neurotransmitters. So once, once these red dots or the neurotransmitters are released, they are receive receivers or the receptors are present in the next cell, the signal receiving uh, neuron or muscle. And these are nothing but again ion channels. These blue ones who are receiving the signal are called ion channels. So these ion channels are gated again. Normally they are closed. See, they are, should they are. Uh, gates are closed. It's not allowing ion to pass in. But once they are bound by these <coughs> Excuse me. Transmitters or the neurotransmitters, their gates open. So these are ligand -like gated or neurotransmitter gated ion channels. Right. So now plus ions move in. It could be sodium, it could be calcium in many cases. So these different types of mechanisms are involved. We are not going to too much detail because this topic is not uh, there in your syllabus, uh, the part I am covering at least. And for the sake of time. Okay, so this is a huge mechanism involved here. That mechanism we are not studying, that is described here. And this is involving chemical substances being released to the next cell at the synaptic cleft. In the next cell receives the chemical and opens uh, plus ion channel. So this plus ion will move in and depolarize the next cell. And that's it. The next cell is also depolarized in a local manner and that will spread throughout the cell. Okay, that's it. That's all I had to talk about. And these are different books or resources that you can follow. And uh, 
I'll be happy to take questions from you. Hello, I'm audible. I'm sure I have uh, uh, made a little, have taken a little longer, but I hope uh, I have made the points clear. Any questions from anybody? Students uh, are requested Sir. to. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Yes, sir. That um, I'm saying that uh, how the um, resting potential um, reaches that um, threshold potential that minus p five millivolt. Yes. Uh, which in um, ions um, exchanges occur? Yes. So uh, the ion that is exchanged is sodium ion. In most cases, it is sodium ion. Okay. So, uh, so uh, there are two ways. One way I was telling that our sensory neurons, which when receives those uh, different substances like light or chemical substances for taste or uh, olfaction. So those are one mechanism to open some ion channels itself. So they are opening ion channels and allowing in many cases sodium to move in. But another way to initiate the whole process to reach the potential potential is this. And you see this slide. So here, another, uh, if it is not a sensory neuron, that is being stimulated. Suppose this second neuron is not a sensory neuron. So, uh, of course, it's not a sensory neuron because it is receiving stimulus from another neuron. So it's a secondary neuron. So uh, this secondary neuron usually gets stimulated by uh, this method. It is being it is receiving the chemical from another neuron. It is having these channels open. So what channels open here? I'm not showing you. Uh, much but this is what type of channels open so usually it could be sodium channel to move in and in many cases it is also possible that it can open chloride channels to uh, to open up when chloride channels open this then what will happen it can can you tell me so suppose this is going to the, left, the second neuron has opened uh, where the, upon binding to the neurotransmitter a, a different type of ion channel has opened here chloride channel has opened so if chloride channel opens and chloride passes in the cell what will happen to the cell whoever asked the question um, can you guess i forgot who asked the question sorry so can you guess what would happen the, when the chloride channel opens and chloride moves in Just any guess. I'll not shout at you. Definitely, I can promise. No guess here. What happens when sodium moves in? The cell gets depolarized, right? Aditya. Aditya, can you tell me or anyone else can try what would happen if the second cell opens up chloride channel instead of sodium channel. Sodium channel opening will lead to uh, sodium to move in so that the second cell will get depolarized. When chloride moves in, chloride channel that is carrying negative, negative charge. So the potential will go in what direction? Okay, let me draw it. Then you can guide me and tell me what is going to happen here.
Yes, someone wants to try and tell me what is happening. Sir, there is more negative charge inside the second neuron. Yes. So let me. Uh, okay, don't mute yourself. So since you have opened up, so this is minus seventy. So this is where we were. This second neuron was at minus seventy. When my, more negative charges go in, which direction would we move? Up or downwards? Yes, minus towards minus. So instead of making an action, potential it is going to downwards. And when the potential yes, is downwards, what it is? What is it called? Upwards depolarization. Downwards. Depolarization. Depolarization. Uh, no, from upwards to downwards. Hyper depolarization. Hyperpolarization. Exactly. So it is getting hyperpolarized. Hyperpolarized. Hyperpolarization is happening here. Okay. If fluoride is moving, it hyperpolarization will happen. So what, what is the necessity of having a neuron getting hyperpolarized? If a neuron gets hyperpolarized, now this neuron will be more difficult to depolarize. If it remains in hyperpolarized state, this will be more difficult to open up, more difficult to stimulate. So that is also necessity in the body sometimes. Not just stimulating neuron, but to suppress neuron's activity. That happens when fluoride channel is open. So suppose too much of stimulation is happening in some part of our brain. So there is a mechanism to stop that. Suppose you are you have seen something unpleasant and you have become too excited, and that too much excitation, too much excitement is not good for you. Suppose at that point that brain knows that, so it just inactivates your neurons so that you become you come back to ground state, you come back to resting state. So that Sir. mechanism is also there. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Sir, does the yeah, anesthesia yeah. depends upon uh, hyperpolarization? Kind of, yeah. Uh, it is a very complex mechanism, but to some extent, you can say that it is kind of a hyperpolarization. Yes. Okay, sir. Very good point that you have made. Good. So, any question from anybody? So, we have to conclude. Any question? So we are running short of time. Any question from anybody? Otherwise, we will conclude today's session. It is not fault that I have uh, uh, taken too much time. So I think no more questions for today. On a dhunnova dhuvijit dash ke mulloban to to nirbaro monograhi bokti tar chunno. Ami obhinondon janatsi. এখন আমরা শেষ পর্বে এসে পৌঁছেছি আমি বিজয়নারায়ণ মহাবিদ্যালয় প্রাণীবিদ্যা বিভাগের সহকারী অধ্যাপক ও বিভাগীয় প্রধান ডক্টর সরোজ কুমার ঘোষ মহাশয়কে ধন্যবাদ জ্ঞাপন এবং অনুষ্ঠানটি আনুষ্ঠানিক সমাপ্তি ঘোষণার জন্য আমন্ত্রণ জানাচ্ছি উই আর গ্রেটফুল টু ইউ ডক্টর অভিজিৎ দাস ফর ইওর নাইস প্রেজেন্টেশন এন্ড ইলুমিনেটিং ইওর ভ্যালুয়েবল নলেজ উইথ আস আই থিংক ইওর ভ্যালুয়েবল লেকচার অন স্ট্রাকচার অফ নিউরন resting membrane potential origin of action potential and its propagation across the nerve fibers will be effective for our students in their academic endeavor we are gratified to you sir for accept our invitation and spending your precious time with us also thanks to my beloved students for attending the lecture thank you everybody have a nice day thank you uh, dr ghosh and dr manavish mukhopadhyay manavish mojumdar uh, i am very grateful uh, to you to sham also uh, for uh, inviting me and giving this opportunity to uh, talk on in front of these students i am always very uh, feel very good to come back to bardhaman and uh, this is one of the opportunities that arised and i am very uh, much thankful to this uh, organization and to this uh, to the people who have organized thank you all of you and to all all the students my thanks and uh, oh i didn't notice a lot of uh, questions or no uh, okay so my email address have been given i think uh, you can contact me if you have further questions i'll try to solve them by email and i some of you have uh, requested for study material i can uh, happily share the powerpoint material over here can i uh, send it to someone like sam can you coordinate by uh, i can send the powerpoint material yes, that please. i have uh, you, you may send it to me so that i can post it to their respective group okay fantastic
Okay, thank you. I think I will uh, leave the meeting right now. Thank you very much. Okay, don't know. Don't know what. Don't know what. Ah, Manoj da. Sham, tell me, I am going to leave. Go away.